Okay. So remember that you have a homework assignment that is due and it's on Canvas and it's about um, animals evolving in cities. And so you want to watch or listen, excuse me, listen to the interview with the um, author of the book and then answer those questions that are in Canvas. So I noticed that some of you have already done that. So it is due by midnight tonight. And then if you're late, it's a 10% reduction um, and it's worth 15 points or 10% reduction for every day that you're late. So you might want to get onto your Canvas site and take a look at that if you haven't already. Okay, so today we're going to continue our discussion of the different major animal phyla um, that we see. And so we're going to talk, start talking about um, today the mollusks. And um, we did a dissection on Monday of the squid, and that is an example of a mollusk. So one of the interesting things about organisms within this phylum is, is that they are very diverse in their structure. Right? So this includes um, the uh, slugs, also includes the snails. Those are kind of similar in their structure but it includes clams, oysters, mussels. Those are very similar in their structure in that those are um, what are referred to as bivalves. And then we have the squid, the octopus, and the nautilus. So one of the things that we have to ask is why would somebody put all of these organisms together? And mollusk actually means soft body. And so these organisms tend to have a soft body and they also tend to have three characteristics that is shared amongst all of them. And the first characteristic is, is that they have a mantle. And so in the squid, that was the outer body structure that was very muscular and it allows them to swim. But it also, in many mollusks, secretes the shell. So this is the tissue that secretes the shell. Now in the octopus, we have completely lost the shell. I'll show you an image of a nautilus. The nautilus has a shell, um, but it also it has is very intelligent and a active predator, just like the octopus and the squid. And the squid squid has a reduced shell, so you might have noticed that sometimes that is referred to as the pen. So that provides some support um, for the muscle and the shape of the body. So. The second characteristic is they have what is called a visceral mass. So viscera refers to like the organs in the body. So like my stomach and my intestines and my liver, those would be my viscera. And in the mollusks, they tend to have the reproductive and digestive organs grouped together in one mass. Did you say organs in the body? Yes. So the stomach and the liver and the digestive glands um, are, and the reproductive glands are all kind of together. And so we're going to look at this in the clam um, in dissection um, uh, this week. Okay. The third characteristic that we see in um, these organisms is, is that they have a muscular foot. So this muscular foot allows for movement in the slugs and the snails. They actually move on this muscular foot. The clams, the oysters, and the mussels can use their muscular foot to burrow so they can get down into the sediment and then filter water. And then your, uh, the squid, the octopus, and the nautilus have modified this in tentacles. So in some, it is modified into tentacles. 
So what that means is the muscular foot of the snail is homologous to the tentacles of the squid because they come from embryonically and evolutionarily the same structure. So those tend to be the three characteristics that all mollusks share and that's why we group them together into one classification. We could also then subsequently look at their DNA, for example, and determine how they are related to one another. So we have an ancestral mollusk, and I'll show you what um, in a minute what we think those look like. And this ancestral mollusk gave rise to a group called the bivalves and a group called the gastropods. And then we have another group called the cephalopods. Okay. So these are the three groups that you need to know. So the bivalves would be like the clam, the, uh, um, what did I say, the oyster, the mussels. Those would be the bivalves. And that makes sense because there are two halves of a shell, two valves, right? The gastro, gastro means stomach and pod means foot. And so these are the ones that move around on their, their stomach. So that would be like the slugs and the snails. And we're gonna talk about uh, nudibranchs in a minute because those are very um, uh, diverse group of gastropods that are marine slugs. And then the cephalopods, cephalo means what? What does cephalization mean? Okay. Head. So the cephalopods, this is head-footed. And so we see that these organisms have, <coughs> if I was to look at a derived characteristic in these, we would say that these are the tentacles, right? But they also have a enlarged brain and a complex set of sensory structures. So we'll put the complex eye. So their eye is just as complex as ours and able to see images just as well. The other thing that makes the cephalopods different is, is that they have what is called a closed circulatory system. And we're going to talk about circulatory systems in detail, but the circulatory system is the heart and the blood vessels. And so closed means that blood is always contained within vessels. And so this is different from the ancestral open circulatory system. So open means that they really don't have blood, they have another form of fluid that then goes into a body cavity and then just kind of washes the tissues and then has to percolate back into the heart before it is pumped back out to the body or to the gills. And so open circulatory systems tend to not be as efficient as closed circulatory systems. And so we see that this one of the reasons why all of these characteristics evolved in the cephalopods is, is that they are active predators versus the bivalves and the gastropods that tend to be not as active predators. So this would be an ancestral trait right here. And so by putting it back on my cladogram, that tells me that the bivalves and the gastropods still have an open circulatory system. So that's how I would read this cladogram for information, is I'd say that that uh, little mark right there tells me that bivalves and gastropods have an open circulatory system. So the closed circulatory system seen in cephalopods is a derived trait. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So if we look at some examples of these, the sea slugs are very diverse, and they have a name which is called the nudibranch, or the nudibranchs. 
And so when you see them in warm coastal waters like in coral reefs, they tend to be very colorful. And they also tend to have appendages that come off like gills. And then they can also have dorsal appendages um, that um, stick off of the organism. So then you can see the terrestrial snail. And then we can see the cephalopods, this being the nautilus. It still has a complex eye, tentacles, large brain. It's still an active predator, but it has retained its shell. So one thing that has happened in some of the mollusks is that they have lost their shell. And this includes the terrestrial slugs. So when you look at a terrestrial slug and they're like out because it's been raining and they're probably in your garden, garden munching because they're herbivores in most cases. And so what they're doing is they have a little tooth-like structure called a radula and they actually are scraping at the vegetation and feeding on the vegetation. Um, when you look at their mantle, they have no shell over their mantle, but they have an opening in their mantle. And so this is actually an opening into their respiratory system. So that is why it's called a pneumostome. And so they do not breathe through their mouth like we do. So this hole will open and close as they draw air in. And so why do you think that they don't have just gills exposed on the surface of their body? Why do you think they have essentially a primitive lung? What would be the advantage of not having gills? You can live on land, but why? Why, why don't you just have the gills sticking out in the, when you're on land? What is a problem with being on land compared to being in the water? What do we have to prevent? Like, because we're on land, we have to prevent dehydration. Dehydration, excellent. So you have to prevent water loss, right? So if the gills are just sticking out in the environment, the gills have to be moist in order for oxygen to diffuse through them, right? They're respiratory. And so having an uh, internal lung, like you see in the terrestrial slugs, that actually prevents them from water loss. Okay, that prevents a little bit of water loss because their respiratory membrane is on the inside of their body. So we have another example of an acquisition of a foreign trait. And so remember that this was one of the major mechanisms of macroevolution. So in this particular example, we see a nudibranch. And the nudibranchs can feed upon cnidarians. They also can eat algae. They can also eat crustaceans. They can actually also eat each other. So some nudibranchs are carnivorous and actually eat other nudibranchs. So these are sea slugs, and this is an example of a nudibranch eating um, a cnidarian, so a col colony of polyps. And so in this particular example, this is really quite amazing, and we don't completely understand the mechanism, mechanism, mechanism of it. But the nudibranchs feed upon cnidarians. And they separate out the stinging cells. And then these stinging cells actually become incorporated into their um, dorsal appendages. And this is a mechanism for protection. So the nudibranchs themselves do not have the genes to produce cnidocytes or stinging cells, but by feeding on them, they somehow sort it out so that those stinging cells do not trigger so that their barb, their nematocyst doesn't fly out and, and paralyze. And then they just incorporate them into their appendages. So if something brushes against their appendages, they get stung. Okay. And so that is a defense mechanism.
So that's quite an amazing feat for the digestive system to be able to do that kind of sorting and then to figure out how those cells would get migrated into the inside of the tissues. So that's um, something that we uh, generally do not quite understand. One of the interesting things is that these uh, nudibranchs produce a mucus that actually inhibits the firing of the stinging cells. So when they feed upon them, the stinging cells do not get triggered because of their mucus. <clears throat> so the mucus interacts with the stinging cells somehow and prevents them from firing. So that would be in a good example of an acquisition of a foreign trait. And then these organisms also can become photosynthetic. And so this is just an example of a nudibranch that has fed upon algae. And just like with the coral, the algae become incorporated into their tissues. And now we have an animal that is photosynthetic. So when these organisms are first born, when they hatch out, they are not green. And it is only after they start to eat the algae that they become green. So again, it's interesting to see how that digestive system would take in the algae and then pass it to the tissues without digestion occurring. Okay, so we're gonna go back up to talking about the um, ancestral uh, uh, mollusk. And so this is what the ancestral mollusk is believed to have looked like. And there's actually a group of, of modern day mollusks that are very similar to this and they're called chitons. And you don't need to know that. But notice how the shell is um, many, many plates and then they have this very muscular shaped foot. So this is also a mollusk that you might see on the Oregon coast, for example, or in a coral reef. And they are simply feeding upon the algae on the rocks because they have this tooth-like structure which um, allows them to kind of graze on the algae. So this is kind of what a, an, the ancestral mollusk is believed to uh, look like. And then it became modified and underwent divergent evolution. So we're gonna watch a video um, about um, the giant squids because we did our squid dissection. So I thought you might be interested in this. And this is actually taken, this, these videos are really interesting. They're PBS and they're Science Friday and they're called the Macroscope. And they're short videos that talk about scientific um, endeavors. So we're gonna watch this video. The giant squid is a good symbol of all the things that are unknown about the vast deep ocean. But it's not just their size that enthralls our imagination. It's that they're so elusive. When giant squid are found, they're usually found floating at the ocean surface or washed ashore one at a time irrefutable proof of monsters lurking in the deep. But what we don't really have a good sense of is how many of them there are in the world's oceans. Perhaps the biggest unanswered question about the ocean's biggest mystery. As the curator of mollusks at the Delaware Museum of Natural History, Dr. Liz Shane researches cephalopods, from gigantic mysteries to more manageable cases. One of the things I like about my work is that I, I have lots of different kind of pathways to discovery. Her inquiries often lead her into the museum's extensive collections. So we have squids and octopus that were collected from a variety of deep sea explorations, and they were in different places up and down the East Coast. So little is known about many of these creatures of the deep that just deducing their species requires more than mere observation. We have two small Dumbo octopus eggs with hatchlings in them that we have done some MRI analysis and micro CT, so we're able to look inside the animal. And we're going to try to use that information to figure out which species these uh, octopus belong to. Poking and prying open a specimen like these brachiotuthis squid may provide hints about their life cycles. We noticed that there were kind of two different morphologies that were being collected one that was light and one that was dark. So the question became then, are these two different species? DNA testing proved they were not. 
So right now we are going back through our collection and we're trying to get a sense of, is it true that all the males are light and all the females are dark? And at what age do they reach sexual maturity? Dissections like these are even more revealing for rare specimens like the giant Architeuthis. So I've been working with Clyde Roper and the Smithsonian for a lot of years. We were able to add to Clyde's long list of, of dissections and morphometric analysis of giant squid. In addition to getting an up-close view of their durable beaks, you'll discover giant squids are not of the improbable proportions of lore. It's more common to have a mantle length of about one to two meters. But still, that's nothing to sneeze at. That is, that is a lot of, of squid. What you won't deduce is how many of these behemoths are out there. To find that out, you usually have to look deeper. So I've been very fortunate to be able to be included in some of the research that the National Marine Fisheries Service has done. With the help of remotely operated vehicles, Dr. Shea and colleagues scour footage and pictures to catalog species living around 1,000 to 2,000 meters deep. So we're often along the edges of habitats where there is a, a big drop off behind, you know, in the scene. And so that's often where all the action is. What are they looking for? Anything, really. Right now, we're, we're doing some basic exploration. You know, who's here when, and where are they located? We see a lot of big purple octopus called Ramelendi varicosa. We see tiny little purple potato rossia, like little purple muppets sitting on the bottom of the ocean floor. And then occasionally, if you're lucky, you'll see a gumbo octopus fin flapping on their way through the water column. Yet despite the unusual suspects, there's only been two brief sightings of giant squid in the deep ocean, certainly not enough to make an estimate of their populations. With limited data, Dr. Shea, Dr. Roper, and colleagues turn to the animal that knows the giant squid best, their natural predator, the sperm whale. One of the ways to understand what sperm whales eat is by looking inside the stomach and looking at the beaks that are present in the stomach of the sperm whale. It was those durable beaks that provided enough evidence to make a calculated estimate. So we just sat down with a pencil and paper and said, okay, well, let's say that there's 360 or 350,000 whales left and they eat one squid a month. Let's just do the math. We arrive at a seemingly impossible figure. So there's a lot of challenges wrapped around that number. Uh, we don't know that sperm whales eat one a month. They could actually eat less or they could eat more. If they eat one per week, you get it's over 130 million giant squids in the world's oceans. Those are numbers are what could be at its outermost extreme. And they're, they're big numbers, but it's the biggest unexplored area on the Earth. What this means is that the ocean's most epic battle of titans is actually fairly commonplace and could be happening right now. And again, right now. And again, right now. And again. For our technical overlords, I'm Luke Roskin. Okay. Any questions about that? Any comments? Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next phyla. And this is the phylum Anelida. And so, Anelida, this is the segmented worms. And so, these include things like the earthworm. But we also have all kinds of marine worms, which include like the clam worm. We also have the Christmas tree worm, which actually has um, appendages that stick out and look like a Christmas tree because they are filter feeders. And so sometimes you see these images of, in the, of these in coral reef pictures. Um, and then we also have leeches. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I wanted to put, this is the giant tube worms. Okay. So we have worms that make tubes, and in some cases they're very large. So they could actually be like maybe 15 feet in length. Um, 
So uh, those giant tube worms tend to live really deep in the ocean. And we're going to watch a video in a minute that talks about how they obtain energy. OK. So just because these organisms are kind of round in shape, it does not mean that they have radial symmetry. So they have bilateral symmetry. And this can be seen internally in their um, anatomy. They also have a true body cavity. So they have a coelom. And this body cavity is lined with mesoderm. And the organs sit in this, in, this, in this body cavity. They also have a closed circulatory system. So they have hearts and blood vessels. And the blood is always contained within the vessels, so it's closed. And the other thing that's really important with these is, is that they are soft bodied. So when we ask about their skeleton, it is what is referred to as a hydrostatic skeleton. So hydro means fluid, water, and static means that it is contained within one segment of the, of the earthworm or of the worm. So when we look at these segments, so I'm just going to draw some segments. Okay. These segments have water or fluid in them. And the segments can actually become thinner or thicker depending upon the muscles that contract. Okay, so I kind of drew some thick and thin um, segments. Okay, so this is the coelom filled with fluid. We actually have two sets of muscles that surround the outside of the earthworm. And the earthworm um, has some uh, longitudinal muscles that will contract in this direction. So if those longitudinal muscles contract in this direction, it's going to force the fluid to move up. And what's going to happen is, is that segment is going to become thicker and wider. And so that is going to allow that segment to move individually because of the contraction of those muscles. And then if we have the, so this would be my longitudinal muscles because they're running down the length of the organism. Okay. If we have the circular muscles, they're going to contract in this direction around the entire segment. And then what that is going to do Oh, wait a minute, did I screw that up? Uh, I contracted that way. Oops, sorry, I messed up these, these arrows. I knew that didn't sound right. Okay, so you might wanna draw this on another segment. You could draw it down here. So if I have these contracting like this, what's it gonna do is it's gonna push the fluid out in this direction. Sorry about that. So the fluid is gonna be pushed out if it contracts like this, so this segment is going to shorten. If it contracts around, then it's going to get long. Like this. Okay. So these would be the circular muscles. Okay. So the whole point of this is, is that you have an earthworm that has a soft body, it doesn't have any skeleton. So how is it gonna burrow through compacted soil? So when you're walking around in the springtime, you might notice that in places where people have been walking and the soil is all compacted, you might notice these little holes, these little middens, and you might notice loose dirt surrounding the holes. And that is actually the earthworms coming up through the compacted soil and kind of making the dirt come up with them. And what they'll do is they'll take organic material like leaves and they'll bring it into their burrows and they burrow through the soil and they can do this because of the hydrostatic skeleton. And so this is what is referred to as peristaltic burrowing.
And this is actually the exact same way that our esophagus works because we have circular and longitudinal muscles and the esophagus can force food down into our digestive tract. So we'll talk about this movement again when we start to talk about the digestive system. So peristalsis in the digestive system um, also describes this type of, of alternate contraction and relaxation. Okay, so this allows for um, this burrowing, and this does two things. It aerates the soil. Without earthworms, we actually sometimes have to go in and use machines. And so you see those machines that pull up the plugs from the grass? That actually aerates the grass so that the grass doesn't die because the grass gets really compacted. And so um, aerating the soil is a really important function of earthworms. And then it also um, functions to, um, to mix up the organic material. So it's kind of composts the organic material. Now earthworms eat soil and then they urinate. And so they also release nitrogen into the soil. So they eat soil. So when you see worms in your garden, it's a really good thing, right? They're not gonna be eating your plants, they're eating the dirt, and then they're releasing nitrogen, and then the nitrogen is what can feed the plants. And so, you know, they have, you might have seen at the farmer's market, they have compost tea, where they actually um, grow uh, uh, compost worms that eat your uh, kitchen scraps, for example. And then these compost worms produce <coughs> fluid, and then they they uh, they put it into containers and they sell it as compost tea, which is actually just um, the nutrients, the nitrogen that the, that the um, earth earthworms, the compost worms, have produced. Not for drinking. Not for drinking. It's for putting in your garden. Yes, <laughs> compost tea. Yeah, that's a good point. You don't drink it. Okay. Okay. So if we look at the earthworms, right? If we look at their body cavity, this is their digestive tract, but they also have this open body cavity. Their nervous system is also segmented. So each of their segments has a little brain in it. Um, they also have a cephalization. So they have a brain that coordinates the movement. Okay, this is their little kidneys. So their kidneys are in each segment. And so they actually excrete, they actually urinate from each segment of their body. And then they breathe through the surface of their skin. So when you see them come up in the springtime because they are, uh, it's, it's because the soil has become so saturated that they're drowning. And so they come up to get air, to get oxygen. So if the soil becomes too saturated and there's no air down there, they have to come up in order to breathe. And then if you're ever lucky enough to see earthworms mate, they are hermaphroditic and they actually line up in opposite directions and they swap sperm. And then they, uh, those, those uh, enlargements on their body actually produce a cocoon and the enlargements are called the flotellum. And that cocoon picks up the egg and the sperm and then it drops it off into the soil. Now, one of the really interesting things about earthworms is, is that all of the earthworms that you think about are not native to North America. So the earthworms in your garden are not native. So they are believed to be European in origin. So we do have native earthworms, but most of those are in decline, if not going extinct. And so we have a native earthworm that's called the Palouse earthworm. And this is kind of what it looks like. We thought they were extinct and only in museum collections. These earthworms are larger than your normal earthworm and they tend to be lighter in color. So this would be like a Palouse earthworm and this is your uh, non-native earthworm. And um, they are called the Palouse earthworm because if you think about the Palouse, it is an ecosystem of rolling grasslands. 
And so prior to uh, agriculture, all the wheat farms from like here all the way up to Idaho, like um, the Palouse region in Idaho, all of those, it was actually a grassland with very diverse, uh, it was a very diverse ecosystem. And the soil is very deep in these grasslands, which is why they're good for wheat farmers. And um, these earthworms actually burrow much deeper um, into the soil than the non-native worms. And so they need deep soils in order to survive. And so with the cultivation of wheat, they um, don't do well because a lot of times when they remove the grassland, the soil, if you look at the soil, if you go out and you actually look at the soil in the wheat fields, it doesn't look very healthy because there's not a lot of organic material in it. And so they also add a lot of chemicals to it. And so it's probably, they're probably not able to survive in the monoculture of the wheat fields. So there are some earthworms in um, other places that are even larger than that. So in Australia, Australia is known for giant earthworms. And so this is just an example. I think I would probably think that this was a snake if I saw it, right? Even though it's segmented, but it's more like the size of a snake than of a worm. Okay. We also have giant larger earthworms in the Cascades and the coastal range have their own native species of earthworms in Oregon. So we have a coastal range earthworm. So this is a, the example of the Christmas tree earthworm. So it is a filter feeder. And this is an example of a marine clam worm. And so notice that they have a lot more segments than the um, earthworms that we, uh, than the earthworms. And that's because they use those segments as gills. So aquatic worms tend to have gills. So they tend to have these appendages that stick out. And then finally, we have leeches, right? And so this is actually a diagram um, or an image showing medicinal leeches. And so you can use leeches medicinally because they will um, increase the blood flow to a given wound. And they have their own set of adaptations so when we look at leeches, these are examples of ectoparasites. So last, on Monday, we talked about endoparasites. So these are ectoparasites and they feed on blood. And these ectoparasites, um, are interesting because they produce an anesthetic and an anticoagulant. So anesthetic means that you do not feel it when they attach on. And the anticoagulant keeps the blood flowing. So for example, I've been in the river and didn't notice it. And then when I got out, right, I would have the leeches on my leg and you just kind of brush them off and you'll just kind of keep bleeding. It's just like, it's really interesting. Your blood will just kind of keep bleeding profusely until you get rid of all that anticoagulant. We don't have any leeches around here. We do. Yeah. We have them in the river. You can get leeches in the river. I've, I've personally gotten them in the river. We do not have any terrestrial leeches. So in the tropics, and like in Australia, you can you can have a terrestrial leech, and the leeches can sense your body uh, temperature, and they will actually kind of reach out from the grass and the bushes, and they will attach onto you that way. So that's more tropical, though. I don't think we don't have any terrestrial leeches. Okay, so we're going to watch a video that talks about um, annelids. And this is a different website called The Shape of Life. And The Shape of Life, if you're interested, has all of the different phyla, little animations, little videos. So they have one for the mollusks. They have one for the sponges, the cnidarians. So this is a video that specifically deals with the annelids. And so what I want you to pay attention to in particular is the benefit that annelids have in their ecosystem besides the benefits that I just mentioned about 
um, aeration of the soil and composting of the nutrients. Anyone bold enough to make worm watching a hobby would be dazzled by the sheer diversity of animals. Scientists have identified more than 15,000 species. Each is uniquely striking and beautiful. Equally astonishing is the way that animals have colonized the world. Annelids have adapted to many different habitats. The mud, hard rocky substrates, the deep sea, uh, the intertidal. Worms have mastered their habitat in many ways. In the most surprising places, wherever there seems to be a chance for life, Worms have thrived. Adapting to almost every environment on Earth, worms have evolved in amazing ways. What appears to be a flower is actually the head of a worm. While the rest remains hidden below, the head blooms, filtering food from the water above. The aptly named feather duster worm has also evolved elaborate survival tools. Each of these dazzling appendages is equipped with tiny eyes for detecting danger. The analyt design is elegant in its simple efficiency. flexible, segmented body along with a set of powerful muscles. A gut that runs from head to tail. A sophisticated nervous system. And a pulsing circulatory system. This was a creature capable of burrowing deep into the sediment. These animals may not have been the very first to break ground beneath the ocean floor, but when they did, they unquestionably mastered the art of the earth. With the sun barely over the horizon, McHugh and her students arrive at a worm's paradise, the Oregon coast. Low tide in this bay exposes a vast mud flat, the ideal home for many marine worms. Oh, there's small squirrels. Oh, there he is. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Let's see what this this modest-looking creature, a burrowing marine worm called Aberonicola, makes a most ordinary-looking prize. Good stuff. But when they first appeared. Worms like Aperonicola marked a dramatic turning point for all animal life. They helped pioneer a new realm, a place where few other creatures had ventured. Aperonicola is like a living machine as it pushes its way into the underworld. Its body is uniquely adapted to the life of a miner. Like many of its analytic kin, 
Our Nicola sports frilly gills for breathing. Coordinating its sophisticated muscular system along a segmented body, it produces powerful contractions that propel it deeper into the sediment. There's nothing momentous in the tunneling of worms until you measure their collective impact on the planet. Without worms, the Earth might be a very different place. One of the most accomplished builders in mud flats like this is a worm called Diopatra. The muddy bottom of the estuary is honeycombed with their countless homes. Now, tube dwelling worms can be present in great abundance. You can have many thousands per meter squared that will stabilize the mud habitat itself. By doing so, tube dwellers actually provide a more permanent, stable habitat for other organisms. Diopatra's tubes act like roots to hold together sediment that would otherwise shift. The way they construct their tubes is nothing short of miraculous. Each builder secretes a glue-like compound from glands behind its head. Bound together, particles of sand, bits of shell and algae make a sturdy and deceptively simple home. From the safety of its tube, the worm reaches out to feed. Here, it devours a piece of seaweed. When the tide recedes, the worms retreat to the safety of their hardy shelters. Deep on the ocean floor, far from the sun's energy, these giant tube worms bathe in noxious chemicals that spew from underwater hot vents. Their scarlet gills are flush with blood that ferries chemicals to bacteria living inside their bodies. This unlikely partnership allows the worms to grow more than three feet in a year. Of all the worms that reside in the sea, one of the most fascinating is the terribility. They're called spaghetti worms because they have these long, thin, white, extendable tentacles that go out over the mud surface. And these tentacles are grooved. They pick up particles in their tentacles, move the particles to the mouth. And there at the mouth, they'll sort those particles according to size. <laughs> Some will be used to build up their tube. Most of them are used as food for the worm. This sea star provides a safe haven for an enterprising creature. Tucked in among the sea star's tube feet, an uninvited guest has taken up residence. This scale worm survives and flourishes by hitching a ride on the underside of the sea star and scrounging morsels from its meals. Stealing through the water, these leeches scour ponds and marshes in search of their next meal. They are the masters of stealth, hunting with bloodthirsty efficiency. Sometimes, hapless victims come to them, making for easy prey.
creeping around its victim without being detected, the leech probes for a soft, blood-rich spot to latch onto. Leeches have even developed means to mask their ferocious bite. The bloodsuckers have an anesthetic that they inject into their victims that allows them to suck the blood without being noticed. That's a very effective way of feeding. This leech is equipped with three saw-like jaws that tear into flesh, enabling it to gorge itself, sometimes taking in ten times its own body weight in the blood. Given time, the once graceful leech becomes so engorged it can barely even crawl away. It can now go several months without another feeding. Earthworms can live up to seven years, and some species reach 20 feet in length. Their simple cylindrical bodies can push, pull, and slide themselves into any nook and cranny. With each powerful movement, they industriously burrow deep into the earth. Earthworms never seem to rest. If all the topsoil they have ever turned over was mounded up, it would cover Earth's land mass in a layer 300 miles deep, nearly 50 times the height of Mount Everest. The earthworms bring down this leaf debris by cycling the leaf debris through their gut. They release a lot of nutrients in that food source to other organisms in the soil. They really accelerate the whole decaying process of the leaves by processing it through their one-way gut. Annelids have contributed to the greening and blossoming of Earth, sustaining and nourishing life, forever leaving their subtle but vital mark on every facet of this magnificent planet. Okay, so those tube worms that were in the mud flats, they actually helped to stabilize the soil. So you could put that down as an example of another um, important. Um, so the stabilization of the soil is another important function of the, of the annelids. Anybody come up with another one? Besides that? Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the giant tube worms and more. And these giant tube worms are associated with deep, sea thermal vents. So we're so deep down in the ocean that no light can penetrate. And it was once believed that the only source of ultimate source of energy for the ecosystems on the planet would have been sunlight. So in this particular instance, we have an ecosystem that thrives near these thermal vents that are in complete darkness, so they cannot be relying upon sunlight. And so what they've discovered is, is that um, the organisms rely upon energy that is released from the thermal vents in the form of hydrogen sulfide gas. So this is H2S, which is hydrogen sulfide gas. So 
So this is the ultimate source of energy. Right? So they undergo not photosynthesis, but it is a type of chemosynthesis. So they still take carbon out of the water, carbon dioxide out of the water, but they use hydrogen sulfide as a source of energy to convert that carbon into organic molecules. And so um, they um, do this by having bacteria. So the tube worms have bacteria that are capable of removing carbon from the water and producing sugars. So this would be another good example of symbiosis. So this is an example of coming together Mutualistic, probably, because the bacteria are providing the uh, tube worms with energy, a source of energy, and then the tube worms provide them with a place to live. Okay, so they live actually in their gills. So that's a, an example of symbiosis. We talked about other examples of mutualistic symbiosis, like, for example, in the coral, where we have zoanthellae or algae that live inside of the coral polyps. So this is um, photosynthesis. This is chemosynthesis. And so instead of sunlight as the source of energy, they combine carbon dioxide, water, hydrogen sulfide gas, and oxygen and then this produces sugars or carbohydrates. Okay? So instead of light energy, it is the hydrogen sulfide gas that is the form of energy. So this kind of disproves our initial hypothesis that all of life is dependent upon sunlight as the ultimate source of energy and that this ecosystem, which actually contains crabs and other crustaceans and shrimps and even fish, um, is all based upon chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis. Okay, so we have one more phyla that we're gonna talk about today before we finish. Um, the nematodes are referred to as the round worms. So they are not segmented. They also have a pseudo coelom. So they have a body cavity that is just partially lined with mesoderm. But they do have, like the earthworms, they have a complete digestive tract. So they have a mouth and an anus. Now there's one group of nematodes that has been studied ex extensively, and these are the free living nematodes. And they have a genus name that's kind of hard to pronounce and hard to spell, so I'm just gonna put C. So that's the genus name, and the species name is Elegans. So C. elegans is the example of the free-living nematodes. And these have actually been very useful in the study of animal development because we can watch how they go from a single fertilized egg to an adult, and we can watch to see how those organisms or how those cells um, specialize and differentiate and move. And so um, C. elegans is important in the study of animal development.
It is also ecologically significant like the earthworm in that it feeds upon bacteria and fungi in the soil and it releases nitrogen. So it's an important source of, of soil nitrogen. And so we want nematodes in the soil, but we only want the free living nematodes. We don't want the parasitic nematodes. And so we also have, as an example, endoparasites in this group. And these are endoparasites on animals and plants. So this is an example of a uh, parasite that can parasitize plants. And so that's why oftentimes um, farmers will use chemicals to destroy the nematodes because they're trying to prevent infection, but it also destroys the free living nematodes in the soil as well. And so it'd be a good thing to figure out how to promote free living nematodes and then just kill off the parasitic nematodes. So some of these that you might have heard of that are in this group would be hookworms, pinworms, heartworm in dogs, And so these would not be flatworms as parasites, but they're actually roundworms. So if we look at what these organisms look like, the free living ones look something like this. This is actually an electron microscope picture showing its external structure. They're very tiny and they're microscopic. So we wanna write that they're microscopic. I forgot to do that. microscopic. And so when we look at them underneath a light microscope, they look something like this. So this would be C. elegans. So notice how they're transparent and they um, uh, have um, essentially all of the different tissues that we have. And so they have been very um, useful in studying um, tissue development and how the animals um, develop. So we'll finish today. I'm just going to show you another short video. If that's okay. I'm going to let me get this up here because this is the. So this video is kind of like science fiction, where we are the experimenters on these creatures. We have um. Only we used to, we have eliminated them, although we're going to talk about how they're using them medicinally now. Yes. So we'll talk about how they're used um, medicinally. Because actually they might be really important in treating autoimmune diseases, really bad autoimmune, uh, autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and Crohn's and celiac disease. Okay, so this one's called Hotel Nematoda. So you're kind of plopped down into a, a small room. There's food all around you, as much food as you could possibly want for the rest of your life. You are now in the warm-up time. And then you kind of just go on living your life, moving around, eating as much as you want until you die. My name is Matt Churkin, and I'm a postdoctoral associate at the University of Pennsylvania in the bioengineering department. So the Worm Hotel is an array of 240 wells that we can use to monitor individual animals for long periods of time. They're one millimeter long, free living nematodes. We culture them on auger plates, which are just kind of, it's kind of like a gel, and they eat E. coli bacteria. They live about two to three weeks, and they're kind of a popular model organism to study aging. We know a lot of genes that affect lifespan and health span, but there's 20,000 genes in the worm's genome, which is pretty similar to humans. And for a lot of those genes, we have no idea what those genes do. So the ultimate goal is to understand better the aging process. 
we ended up creating a 3D printed mold, and then we can easily cast worm hotels with silicone rubber. We add auger to each well, then add bacteria on top of the auger, and then we have a device that automatically shoot a single animal into each well. So the worms eat bacteria, and we can uh, engineer the bacteria such that in each well, the bacteria turn off a specific gene in each worm. And that way we can see what the effect of turning off that gene is on the animal's lifespan and their health during uh, the aging process. Basically everything is controlled. So the size of the well is controlled for each worm, the amount of food is controlled, the temperature is controlled. There's a carousel which has a bunch of plate stacks, which is where the worm hotels actually live for most of their lives. Then right next to that, there's a robot tower that can spin around and grab a plate out of the carousels and then spin to the other side of the robotic tower where there's three imaging stations. And then once per day, it will image it for 10 minutes, turn a blue light on to wake the worms up, image for another 10 minutes, and then pick the plate up from the camera and put it back to the stack. The more and more moves, the more pixels will have changed. And we use the amount of movement as a proxy for how healthy each worm is. It's certainly the most simple measurement of health because we don't have to do any more complicated, invasive sort of procedures. About 500 of these 240 well plates will fit in the robot system. So we probably end up testing 2 million animals. It's not really been possible to monitor changes in behavior for so many animals automatically. I don't think it's possible without the robot. You know, manipulating all these worms' lives, you do sometimes feel like an all-powerful being kind of watching over thousands of helpless creatures. But yeah, it's definitely a lot uh, cushier than in the wild. In some ways, these worms are pretty privileged, I would say. Okay, so that's the worm motel. So they are really important and also in, in studying developmental um, genetic triggers for aging. Are there any questions? No? Are you freaked out by that? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will see you on Monday for your quiz. Don't forget to do your homework. Thank you.